All right, guys. Hey, how you doing? Um, lecture 6.9, hypnosis, the last lecture in chapter six. And I thought we'd end with sort of a, a good sort of mind mess up. So hopefully you've already watched the video above me. Does that work? There somewhere. Um, the video above me, which is just a hypnotic session. I just grabbed it off YouTube at random. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't even watch it through. Um, but I assume it's all fine. Uh, I, I know how these generally go down. Um, so if you haven't watched it, watch that first. Okay. And then come back to this video. Off you go. <laughs> Okay, now you're back. Excellent. All right. So I want to talk about hypnosis a little bit. And again, I'm kind of doing this for two reasons. Um, one is it just seems like an oversight that so many students are interested in hypnosis. Maybe they bring it in somewhere else in the textbook, but I can't imagine where else it would fit. Usually it comes in with this consciousness um, chapter, and usually it's described as another altered state of consciousness. But really the question is, is it um, or not? Um, Usually by now, you guys would have went through um, Frosh Week, and one of the fun things on Frosh Week is a hypnotist who does something very much like what you just saw on that video. And so very often students are in my class and they've had that experience. And so when I start talking about hypnosis, they're like, oh, I do want to understand that. And, and that's actually how it happened for me. So that's why I'm bringing you here, just because it really did... Um, kind of make me really interested in psychology and want to understand more. And so if it does that for you too, then then I want to make sure we hit it. Okay, so let me give you my experience. Um, at about the time I was going to university, there was this guy, Ravine. Apparently he's back around. Um, um, I think there was something that made me think that, oh yeah, is back. The super conscious experience of Ravine is back. Uh, the legend continues. So I think I knew him as a slightly younger man, but he would go around to various towns and he would hold these hypnosis shows. Uh, and I went to one of his shows and I found it fascinating. Um, now, I want to highlight a couple of things about, about the show, including stuff you didn't see on the video there because they went after this point, which is when you go see one of these hypnotists, what they initially do is they say, anybody who, who thinks they might want to be on stage and part of the show, come on up. And they have a huge number of people up on the stage. And then they do some things to see how carefully they're paying attention um, and, and sort of doing what's suggested. So, I mean, I'll give you just one example of a classic hypnotist thing. They'll say something like, take your fingers and put them together um, and, and cross like this, and then put them in your hand. And now what I want you to do is until I tell you to stop, I want you to grip that, that hand as tightly as you can and keep it gripped, you know, so that you're, so that it's really tight there and do that until I tell you to stop. And so you're doing that and you're keeping it gripped. Uh, and then they go on and talk about something else for a while, blah, 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 blah. And at some point they say, okay, you know, your hands there, they're now glued together. Um, I'm going to mentally glue them together. So I want you right now to try taking your hands apart. See if you can pull your hands apart. You won't be able to. Give it a try. And what happens is that there's some people doing this. I can't, I can't pull it apart. I can't pull it apart. And then there's other people who do this. Those people that do this weren't really listening because in the first part he said, you know, grasp it and keep it like that until I tell you to stop grasping. Okay. And when he says, pull your hands apart, he's not saying stop grasping. And if you try to pull your hands apart while you're grasping, even if you're doing it just right now, you can't, right? If you're grasping and pulling apart, you can't. You have to release the grasp in order to pull them apart. Uh, and so he goes through and he finds, and, he, and he, the people who pull him apart, he just says, off the stage, off you go, off you go, off you go. And so maybe they start with, you know, 100 or 200 people on stage and they get down. That's quite a bit in that video there, but often they get down to a smaller number, you know, maybe 20 or 25 or 30 people who have very carefully listened to everything this person said and did what he said. Um, now, there's also something else you will have noticed on, on those shows. Every now and then, even when you have that crew and you're asking them to do things, he occasionally asks people to do silly things. That's what makes the show funny, right? And I'm going to tell you about one of them in a second. Uh, but he will tell people to like do ridiculous. I want you to go around and, and, and um, 
make it like you're a chicken, go around and make chicken noises and walk around and do it. And every now and then as he asks people to do things, you'll occasionally see somebody just fall asleep. And they just fall asleep. And when they fall asleep, he'll almost always come over and tap them on the head and say, thank you for particip participating, off you go. And the notion is, you know, well, you'll see, well, let me just mention that. Okay, so that, that's the dynamic of the show. They whittle it down. And even during the show, there's people that are, are being removed from the stage. Um, but those that remain are doing what the person says. Okay, so cool. I'm watching all this too with Ravine. I'll tell you the thing that kind of blew my mind. There was this, this one guy that was on the stage and Ravine said to him, you know, you are going to, uh, you, you, did you come here by yourself? And the person nods to him himself and, says, and Ravine says, okay, no, you didn't. You came here with, with someone named Stella. It's a woman you love very, very much. But uh, when I say, I can't remember what the word is, I'll say peanut butter sandwiches because I'm suddenly thinking of peanut butter. I love peanut butter sandwiches. So anyway, uh, we'll make that the magic word, peanut butter sandwiches. When I say peanut butter sandwiches, you are suddenly going to realize that Stella isn't there with you. And, and you're going to suspect that Stella is with another man. And that's going to just drive you crazy. And so you're going to go looking for Stella uh, as hard as you can uh, at that point because you really need to see her at that point. So he says, this to the guy and the guy's listening and then at some point he lets the guy go and the guy goes back into the crowd he's sitting in the crowd and then at some point a little bit later ravine says i love peanut butter sandwiches whatever he says peanut butter sandwiches for some reason and at first nothing much happens now this is in a hockey arena in fredericton new brunswick um at first he didn't hear much happen but then we start hearing this person screaming stella and he starts popping out of if you've been in a hockey arena you know there's there's places where they can kind of pop out where the crowd is and then they go behind the crowd and they pop out and so he's doing this yelling stella and he's looking really panicked everywhere screaming top of his lungs looking frantically everywhere and i'm sitting there going Oh my God, what the heck is going on here? Um, and what does it feel like is going on here? It feels like this guy is now in control of this guy. It's kind of like normally there's his conscious will that's directing his behavior, but it seems like it's this guy's conscious will that's directing his behavior, that this, that this person has given up sort of what we sometimes call executive control. This is what consciousness does. He's given up executive control to somebody else's consciousness. And this is potentially scary, right? It makes us believe that these hypnotists could make us do things, even things that, that we don't find ethical. Can they? They flirt with that, by the way, in the show. One of the things they love to do is they love to, to say at some point, oh, it's getting hot in here. It's really hot. You are feeling so, so hot. Oh my goodness, you just want to be cooler. And very often men on the stage will take their shirt off uh, in a moment. And, and, and typically, by the way, it's the men who tend to be more built. <laughs> it's the men who you think probably take their shirt off anyway, every first chance they get. Um, and so they take their shirt off because they're so hot. But you will see some women as well start to take their shirt off, like lifting it up. And, and he kind of allows that to happen to a certain extent. Uh, and then at some point he says, okay, no, you feel okay. You're cool again. But he allows the audience to think, if I wanted, that woman would have continued to remove her top. And, and potentially I could tell her to strip totally and she would do this because she is now under my control. You know, that's the feeling that they want to give, which, you know, when you're in the audience, you're like, wow, that is power. This guy's really cool. What the heck is going on? Well, Here's the guys with no shirts on um, <laughs> sitting here beside a woman. Um, they're all passed out. They're hypnotized. Um, so the impression is this, this transfer of will. And this is sometimes called the dissociation theory of hypnosis. And there's a number of, of, of sub variants. But the idea is you've actually sort of split yourself and you're giving conscious control to, to this other person. That's what hypnosis looks like now. Could you make people do things um, that's, that goes against their ethical code? Uh, so you, first of all, you know, when you think of that, you have to think of someone's ethical code. Like, let's say there is a woman who did take off her top, who's, who from the top up was naked on stage. Would a woman do that? Most women would not. 
but there's strip bars. <laughs> there are women who are perfectly comfortable being naked in, in public. Well, in sort of public. Um, so, you know, for them, that might not violate their ethics. And if, if somebody was a stripper that was being hypnotized, they might quite willingly take off their shirt and they haven't violated their ethics. But could you make somebody do something they really would not do otherwise? That's the feeling. Now, here's one of the problems with hypnosis as a science. I always like to show you the challenge of scientifically studying these. Um, it's hard to do research. So, so let me um, tell you about a study and then let... I'll tell you about two studies, and you can think about them. Here's one study. They, they had a study where they had an aquarium with a, a snake in it, and they brought people in who were, who were scared of snakes, um, who, who, I don't know, they weren't that scared of snakes. Everyone's a little scared of snakes, so they didn't go looking for snake phobes or anything, but they brought them in, and they um, told them a story about this snake being dangerous, um, that it was one of these poisonous snakes of, of whatever kind. Um, and then at some point they hypnotized them. And after they were hypnotized, they asked them to reach in and touch the snake and pick the snake up or something like that. And what they found is that people who were hypnotized were willing to do it. What do you think of that? Here's another one that's even a little more stark. They hypnotized people and then they had a gun there and they told people to take that gun and, and shoot somebody and some people picked up the gun and pulled the trigger does that prove it what are you thinking i hope you're thinking the following if you knew you were in a psychology study if you were in an intro psych class and you'd been through a chapter two research methods and you come to do a study you should know at that point that they are not allowed to actually do anything that would cause danger or harm. And so if that snake was really poisonous and going to hurt you bad, they would never get ethics consent to let people put their hands in with a dangerous snake. They would never get ethics consent to let people shoot people <laughs> in, a, in a psychology lab. And so the, the worry is, well, I mean, did these people really believe there was any danger going on? Or did they know there couldn't be any danger and they were just playing along? Just playing along. Let's think about that a little bit. This is the alternate theory uh, of hypnosis. It's something called the sociocognitive theory of hypnosis. And I want to kind of unpack this a little bit because it's interesting on a number of levels. It starts with this. It says, we go through life and we interact with our friends and various people and there's certain behaviors we emit and, and come to be known for and there's certain other things we would never do and we come to be known for our boundaries too. And so people come to know us and, and they think, okay, that's Steve. And Steve's the kind of guy that does this, this, and this, etc. He would never do that, whatever that might be. So let me give you a that. What if the that was, what if I hypnotized you and asked you to go in front of a whole classroom full of people, 400 people, and talk in Chinese? And you told me, I don't know Chinese. And I say, I don't care. Just talk as if it's Chinese. You know, whatever your stereotype of Chinese is, go ahead and do that. And I want you to do it in front of a bunch of people. Many of us would not do that, right? We'd worry it could be seen as, as making fun of somebody or, or, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, me, I, I'll go in front of a class and I'll say, Oh, ching chong, sing this whole, huh? There's my best Chinese for you. <laughs> But for me to demonstrate a concept, I'm a little shameless, right? So I'm willing to sort of do these things, but we all have our bounds of, of what we would do. And the claim is we get trapped within our bounds to some extent. Um, there, if we do things that people don't expect we would do, they, they think there's something wrong with us. Are you okay? What's going on with you? Why are you acting this way? You're, you're kind of odd. So we end up sort of building boxes around ourselves that, that we have to live within. Okay, that's step one. Now, the claim is this. You just went up and offered to be hypnotized. And this person is now going to ask you to do a bunch of silly, crazy things that you would never do. But maybe you might like to do them. Maybe you might wish you could do that. Maybe, you know, I think you want to find the inner, inner Jim Carrey in yourself and cluck around like a chicken and do your best, whatever. <laughs> you know, maybe there's part of you that would really love to do that, but you're like, yeah, but that's not the kind of thing I would do. Ah, but now you have a potential 
out. It's not you that's deciding to do these things. It's the hypnotist. The hypnotist is telling you the silly things to do. It's his idea. And so if you do it, who's to blame? Him. Especially if you never take ownership of doing it. So if you, you know, do the cluck like a chicken thing and, and then you're done afterwards and people say, oh, I saw you on stage, I saw you clucking like a chicken. Well, the claim is you're not going to just say, oh, I wasn't, I was just playing along. Um, because the whole reason you're playing along is you, you wanted to do that, but you didn't want to own it. So as long as you say, you know, I was just playing along, now you're owning it again, right? And the claim is the people that hypnosis works best for, the people they select, are these people who, who like the opportunity to play along without um, penalty. Let me give you an analogy. There are some people you might know who, when they drink alcohol, behave completely differently, generally much less inhibited. Um, and then the next day they'll say, oh man, and if you talk to them and say, you did this, this, and they're like, yeah, yeah, but that wasn't me. That was the alcohol. Oh. And so they're blaming the alcohol for their behavior. The alcohol becomes something they can blame for their behavior. Now in the drunken state, they may actually admit they behave that way, but they can st they still say it was, it was that. Uh, the claim is in the hypnotic state, in the entertainment world, that maybe people are playing along. Maybe they're having fun. Um, maybe if you're that woman and he says it's getting hot, you're, you're enjoying kind of showing your midriff and teasing like you're going to do more because you know the hypnotist won't actually let you do that. Um, at least you think they don't. And if you start to feel like they are going to let you do it, you can always just go to sleep and he will take you off the stage. Going to sleep is your easy out. So what's the social? The notion is you're involved in this social thing, this show where everybody has roles and you quickly learn your role. Your role is to do what that guy says and, and you largely do it and that causes laughter and everyone's having a great time and you're, you're playing your piece and so, so you have your little starring role there. And if it ever becomes uncomfortable, I mean, you could just confront the guy. I'm not really hypnotized, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it, but that's very uncomfortable in that situation. You'd ruin the whole show for everybody. And so what you instead do is just stop playing along. And, and the hypnotist sees that and gives you an easy out which I, without ruining the show. So we have this whole social thing. We have these cognitive bounds. And you are now given um, an option to just be as silly and crazy as you want and never own it because it was the hypnotist that made you do it, even after the show. Yeah, that was crazy. Any of the things I did, I don't know what was going on. I didn't know it. That's the socio-cognitive theory. There is a, there's an extension to that that some people say, so, so it's debatable about whether people are just playing along the whole time very consciously, or whether they're actually even telling themselves that same story, that it's this person that's in command. And so they are playing along, but they are not owning it. Um, they, they are really kind of very directly saying, I'm gonna, just going to do what that guy says. Um, and so it is him. So they're kind of fooling themselves just like they're fooling everybody else into sort of thinking that it's, that it's coming from him. But really, it's coming from them. Their, their desire to kind of be, be in this consequence-free state where you can be as silly and crazy as you want and not, never get in trouble. Which is it? We don't know. Um, you've seen the video and if you watch more of these videos, you know, people can act pretty crazy. Now watch them again with these two theories in mind and see what you think. Um, it makes for great entertainment either way. Okay. But now let's go from the entertainment to here, the, the clinical, because I want you to understand that hypnosis, yes, is used for fun, but it's also a therapeutic tool. Uh, it started with Freud, and of course, Freud thought of this dynamic unconscious, and he thought you could get in touch with it through hypnosis. He liked it for a while, and then he didn't like it. Um, he didn't like it because he realized people sometimes made things up when they were hypnotized, and then when they woke up, they thought the things they made up are true, and that is true. By the way, that's why we cannot, well, once, let me say it this way, once a witness to a crime has been hypnotized, they can no longer be a witness in court. Because if you hypnotize somebody and you say, tell me what you remember, they will tell you the things they remember, but they're also more willing to tell you things that aren't even true. They're more willing to what we call confabulate. If you push them at all, are you sure you don't know what color that person's shoes were? 
yeah, no, I do. They, they, I can see them now. They were blue or whatever. And so they're very suggestible. They'll go along with what you say and they'll give you answers. But the problem is when you wake them up, they remember those images they had and, and, they, and they think that was their real memory. And so suddenly you can't trust their memory, uh, which is kind of interesting. But I highlighted something there that's very important. Their imagery is very strong under hypnosis. So in the clinical world, hypnosis isn't seen as this put somebody in a trance and gain control over them and talk to their unconscious and, and fix, you know, if they want to quit smoking, I'll just talk to your unconscious and I'll tell it, quit it. You don't like cigarettes and everything will be fine. That's not the way clinical hypnosis works. Instead, Clinical hypnosis is more like an approach to getting the person into a deeply relaxed state. So you, you use the hypnosis to get the person very, very relaxed, very, very comfortable. And if you do this right, you'll get them to a point where in their mind, they can create really vivid images, really strong imagery. So this is the most important aspect of hypnosis from a clinical perspective is the really strong imagery that you can create. And now what you can do is use that imagery um, to retrain habits. Now this is conscious imagery. This is the, the important point, right? We're not using hypnosis to attach to the unconscious. We're talking to the person directly. We're saying, okay, you have this imagery and okay, what do you do with it? Let me give you an example. It'll be an example that'll actually anticipate the next chapter, classical conditioning. So I may pick it up there as well, but, but you can do something like this. You could say, um, if this person was a smoker and they wanted to stop, you could say, okay, you're hypnotized. Now in this deep state with this clear imagery, here's what I want you to do. I want you to imagine you're sitting in your favorite place where you smoke. And I want you to imagine there's an ashtray there and you haven't emptied that ashtray um, in a while. Um, so there's all this ashes and all this crap in it. So imagine you dump that, but there's that dirty ashtray sitting right there. And now you light up a cigarette and you can go ahead and have a, a drag off that cigarette. But there's just one rule. Every time before you have a drag of the cigarette, you have to lick that dirty ashtray. And so I want you to imagine doing that. I want you to imagine taking that ashtray and licking it. And how disgusting that would taste because that's the cost of a smoke. Every time you want to smoke, you have to lick that. And so what are we doing? We're associating a disgusting image with pulling the cigarette. And the idea is with deep imagery, if you pair that image enough and you connect it enough, you can associate those two things. So the next time the person really has a cigar in their hand and their cigarette, sorry, and they're really about to take a drag, that imagery comes to mind of the dirty, gross ashtray. And they go, Ugh, I don't really want it. Uh, and so we're associating a new thing, but it's all conscious. It's all reshaping um, the mind, the habits of the mind, often through things like what we're going to call classical conditioning, associating things uh, and using imagery. So it, it's not voodoo by any state. Again, it's just getting the person relaxed so that you have the imagery of the mind and then you can do some mental things. You can do some things in their mind that you could never do. Well, you could do it in the real world. You could ask a person to lick a dirty ashtray, but it's you might not want to. I'm not sure you'd get a whole lot of clients if that was your strategy. Um, but with hypnosis, you can do things like that. So all this to say, I wanted to kind of tie it back around. Even something like hypnosis, at least when it's viewed in this clinical kind of way, fits with that diagram I, I told you about and fits with the general story I said that if you're looking to change some behavior, to change habits, that's the work of the conscious mind. There's no shortcuts. You can't just talk to the unconscious mind and have the unconscious mind fix something for you. It doesn't do that. It does sort of two things. It triggers habits or it biases the way you're thinking about things consciously. Those are the two big ways the unconscious affect us. Uh, and again, the conscious mind, um, it's most relevant when you have to create new habits, when you encounter something you've never done before and you have to figure out how to behave in that situation. So you're building new habits or when your current habits need revision, that's when the conscious mind comes into play and it sort of revises the unconscious habits and then puts them on the right track so they can just run again.
Okay, cool. This all fits with the clinical use of hypnosis. The entertainment one, if you really believe these people are under the full control of the hypnotist, then there is something mysterious going on. I have unfortunately given up on that feeling um, that, that I felt when I first saw Ravine. Um, and I tend to believe this much more scientific psychology approach to it now. This is what science will do to you. Pulls away all your things that raise the hair on the back of your neck because you explained them. And then they're not as cool anymore. They're still cool. All right. That's it for chapter six. I think I'm also going to drop in a few more. These are the people in your neighborhood. Um, I, I've I let that slip a little bit. I've got a few more, not that many more to show you, but I'm going to introduce you to a few more people in the neighborhood. Look for that below as well. And then uh, I will see you in chapter seven. Great, guys. Bye-bye.